of reconciliation and also about reconciliation and particularly uh, recounting of some of the incredible work that you did in South Africa in the 1990s. So without further ado, I'll give it over to you. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Thank you so much. Um, I really loved um, what Bill preached on today of how um, God comes to us hidden in plain sight, um, not so much to condemn us, but for our sake, puts on these disguises so that we're able to be in God's presence and God creates mutuality with us so that we can be with God. Um, to take off our lack of motivation to be with God and to help us to take off our masks, interestingly enough. I wanna, I wanna continue with um, what we've been doing and um, I thank um, you all for staying with us and I do want to get into a little bit about my book at the end, not in a mercenary kind of way, but, but I'm trying to make a claim about a person that I think is hidden also um, and who I think is a saint. So I'll get into that near the end of this presentation. So this is the, the sort of map for us um, to think about and investigate a Christian spirituality of restorative justice uh, rather than retributive justice. Um, most of us, when we think about justice, we think of it in terms of retribution. And I think, especially in light of uh, Bill's sermon today, and especially in light of the, the passage in the Gospel of John, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Um, God's not acting based on retribution. Um, and one of the main premises of what I've been trying to say is that God naturally creates. And to us, that creation looks like um, almost a repetition and so it looks like reconciliation, but, but God creates, that's God's nature. God is our creator and we always interface with God in that way, but we have a special revelation through, through Jesus, um, not to understand God's nature as retribution or wrath, Jesus's revelation to us is to show how God is always for us, always um, redeeming us, always extending life to us. So as we get into the rest of this presentation, I'm hoping that we hold on to that premise that even though it may be confusing for us to read the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament or the Old Testament and the New Testament in terms of um, retributive justice. You know, as Christians, we believe in this revelation that God all along was working to redeem the world, to restore the world. And I was also trying to get us to understand forgiveness in a larger context of the process of reconciliation. And many of us um, in the 21st century as Christians, we've forgotten what was an ancient understanding and an assumption that most Christians understood that we were in this process of being restored to God. And most of the early Christian writers were not really looking to be restored in the future most of the early Christian writers were trying to take us back to the Garden of Eden, trying to help us to understand the effort and the assertion is, is more of an ex excavation, uh, removing that which is hindering what we already had before. And so this 
rite of reconciliation, this process of reconciliation is really a work of excavation. We're, we're more like archaeologists trying to see what's hidden in plain sight, as Bill really encouraged us to see. So the process of reconciliation is important for us to understand this renewing of reconciliation. So for retributive justice, here is um, a typical uh, dictionary uh, definition. It's the response to criminal behavior that focuses on the punishment of lawbreakers and the compensation of victims. In general, the severity of the punishment is proportionate to the seriousness of the crime. So most of us, when we are understanding um, justice, we're understanding it in this way, that it's about punishment usually, and it's also about matching the crime with compensation. The problem is when you are trying to match a crime with compensation, um, it usually looks like this, as, as you can see in 1827. Um, not only is this uh, an individual sort of task of showing the criminal and trying to match to the individual criminal punishment or trying to provide compensation to the victims of these um, criminals, whole swaths of human identity are labeled as criminal. Um, and also the difficulty around retributive justice is with that sort of caste system of who's a criminal, it, um, it creates power structures of those who can define criminality. And this um, has been a major problem in the UK's hierarchy of identities, as many of us know about the class system in the UK, but much of that class system was based on what I just said, whole swaths of people, even the association like Pavlov's dog, the, the associations of people's accents um, for many people was this was a person coming out of a criminal identity. And then I think the last problem about retributive justice comes from uh, one of my favorite Christian mystics, Simone Weil. And she says, there are um, crimes, um, sins, suffering that go beyond any kind of proportionate um, justice. She says, for, for example, when a woman is raped, how do you provide a proportionate punishment? How do you provide compensation that matches such suffering? Or another kind of affliction is thinking about um, a teacher who teaches third grade, for example. And this teacher comes out of a background in which certain kinds of people are not as human as others. And a teacher says to the eight-year-old in explicit terms, you are stupid and that you need to move over into um, another level of education. So just think about the affliction that that eight-year-old set in motion like a big bang is set in motion now, um, as, as many um, social psychologists are saying, you know, now it's um, school, school systems are setting up who will be the criminals because even from an early age, those like black boys, for example, um, are suspended from school or set in motion 
are afflicted basically so that their identities are are stuck and then how do you when that person is in prison or grown or a person who was put in prison for nonviolent crimes how do you compensate a life um, how do you bring justice to a life that is lost and just one more example of affliction um, affliction can be for example at the turn of the 20th century the british put Afrikaners, those are the two major white identities in South Africa. And the British put the Afrikaners in concentration camps because the British were in power around that time in the scramble for South Africa. How do you compensate a people that you place in concentration camps when generations um, understand themselves in ways over and against an empire. And then in turn, just like we learn in social psychology, those who are abused tend to grow up and abuse others. The Afrikaners, um, as in one of the truth and reconciliation hearings, the police confessed that they were killing a, a black person, roasting a black body so that they could remove any evidence of having killed this person while at the same time, they're having a barbecue on the side and they're having a picnic on the side as they are roasting a black body. That's affliction. And how do you bring retribution to such affliction? And Simone Weil says that the capacity to pay attention to an afflicted person is something very rare, very difficult. It is nearly a miracle. It is a miracle. Nearly all those who believe that they have this capacity do not. Warmth, movements of the heart, and pity are not sufficient. So in other words, she's saying that most of us cannot see the afflicted. Um, those in power create a worldview in which it's not affliction, it's normality. It's the way things should be. But Simon Weil being this powerful Christian mystic is trying to help us see what is hidden in plain sight. Not only God's presence, but to see how we are removing our own presence. We are accepting the deletion of other human identities as normal. So for me, retributive justice is deeply problematic as a Christian and especially in Christian spirituality. The main work for us in Christian spirituality is restorative justice rather than retributive justice. And just as an introduction to what restorative justice is, I wanna play this, this clip for us. A single act of crime can affect someone long after it happens. The mind replays it endlessly, warping what really happened and consuming our thoughts. No one can undo what happened, but there is a simple process which 85% of victims of crime said helped. Restorative justice 
is a process through which victims can meet their offender. It allows them to ask questions, have their say, and move on with their lives. Help us spread the word about restorative justice. You never know who it may help in the future. Restorative justice works. Share this film and help us spread the word. So much of what is um, taught in scripture is simply and without a doubt restorative justice. When Jesus teaches us to first go and face those that we have harmed before we are taking any kind of practice of communion or the Eucharist, um, we must first be reconciled. So to go and face those that we have harmed. Our criminal justice system today doesn't really have the mechanisms and the practices in which um, those who are the perpetrators of violence and crime can actually interface with those who are the ones who are the victims and those who are the recipients. And so much we've learned in psychology and especially in spirituality to move out of the brandings and the afflictions that, that most of us who have experienced violence we do need that encounter. We need the encounter with those who have put us into an identity to make sure that that is not one that will stay and one that will brand us for life. Restorative justice is important because as I was trying to say for Christian spirituality, we are entering into through restorative justice, a creative measure similar to what I, I see as God's nature, creativity, to move us out of those stuck ruts of identities that those in power can place us in. And just another short clip in terms of the nuts and bolts of how restorative justice is important practically for us today. Restorative justice represents a paradigm change from thinking about justice as a mechanism for social control to think about justice as a mechanism for social engagement. We know that people are, that are engaged in healthy ways socially and emotionally make better decisions and so restorative justice seeks to be socially and emotionally intelligent justice. So one way to think about how restorative justice differs from a criminal justice process is the questions we ask. So in a criminal justice process, we ask the question, what happened? Who did it? What do they deserve? In a restorative justice process, we ask a different set of questions. We said, what happened? Whose obligations are these? And what do we need to do to right the wrongs? But we know that injustice creates social emotional harms to people and relationships. And so restorative justice is about repairing those relationships and repairing the harm done. An important part of a restorative justice process is we ask people, how are you affected? And we don't ask those questions in a criminal justice process. We focus on the facts. So we know that victims' voices are not heard strongly in a, in a courtroom. Victims' voices are heard strongly in a restorative justice process. So what we know um, the victims who participate in the restorative justice process, they, um, they're more satisfied. Their, their satisfaction in the justice system is increased. They're less likely to seek revenge, you know, following the, uh, the injustice. We also know that their experience of post-traumatic stress is greatly reduced. Participation in a restorative justice process well, it takes great courage to come face to face with the person that's offended you. It has huge social emotional benefits. People go back to work. They don't have that fear. Every time they go by the place where the offense occurs, it's a, injustice is a very visceral feeling. 
and restorative justice, um, because it's emotionally intelligent, um, repairs that visceral aftermath that we hold within us when we experience injustice. Any place where, we, where relationships matter, people benefit from, from restorative justice in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities. Having the skills and the framework to think about resolving conflict, and conflict is a normal part of life, it can either shut us down or it can provide us an opportunity to learn and grow and better understand each other. And that's what restorative justice is. So here are my assumptions and what I've learned when I think about uh, restorative justice uh, and why this for Christian spirituality. First, um, none of us um, are neutral in conflict. Um, we may think we're neutral, but ever since the larvae, as Bill was saying, ever since our um, inception, we have been socialized from birth um, to take certain biases and certain perspectives. And as a Christian, one of the perspectives that I think we've been socialized to understand is that all of us are forgiven. And that's, that's a bias that we learn from Christian spirituality. And I think that's a worldview. And it's, I think it's a harder worldview than to think that we can go around and forgive people. Jesus told a parable about this, as a matter of fact. Those who know that they are forgiven, um, that's a very difficult life and worldview to act from because it it makes us assume we have humility. But most of all, it makes us uh, theist, meaning makes us believe in God. To know that we are forgiven is assuming the presence of God. So that's why I think it's important. And it's important also from um, the director of the Restorative Justice Project that you just heard that conflict is not all bad. Um, we need a worldview in which to engage conflict and to be intelligent in the midst of conflict. And Christian spirituality and this premise that we are forgiven, to me, is our intelligence. It, um, as Tutu wrote in one of his books, there's no future without forgiveness. I mean, that's just rational. Um, if we operate based on impulse, um, and revenge, the natural outcome is sort of Einstein's dystopian future that the next war will be fighting with sticks and stones. Also, I think Christian spirituality supports restorative justice in terms of the misuse of Christianity to justify disproportionate violence. And um, we can talk about this in our discussion, but there's a thousand examples. Um, and I'm sure that we can think that through. And the use of scripture, for example, when Jesus says metaphorically, I've, I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. Throughout church history, we've taken those kinds of verses and we've run with it to basically commit genocide in certain circumstances. And for Christian spirituality, we have, uh, understanding that absolute power amounts to using Christ's name in vain. To think that we can actually be in power absolutely as human beings is to be against God. Um, and to, as I was trying to say, many of us live in a worldview in which we take as normal other people's affliction. And that's what power does. Power corrupts and, and uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely because it it distorts our 
vision of the world. And so can you imagine in such a worldview practicing retributive justice rather than the iconoclastic way that Jesus teaches us to disabuse power, to, to look beyond what we think of as power and effectiveness. And then lastly, I think Christian spirituality facilitates a discernment of God in the midst of conflict. And this is basically what Bill preached today in his sermon, a beautiful sermon to get us to see where is Jesus. And I think we have to learn that. Um, we have to, we depend on a community to see it. And oftentimes we can't even pray and we have to depend on others to pray on our behalf. And I think Christian spirituality is really important to facilitate this understanding that God is in the midst, in our midst, even though we want to live without God. So a little comic relief, and then I wanna talk a little bit about my book, because usually I always try to bring comic relief because um, I'm sort of like the Hollywood star. I'm always branded to bring doom and gloom. So here is one of my favorite um, sitcoms from the BBC called Rev. And this is an example of um, the church misusing power in a humorous way as Rev is a rector a priest in the, in the urban area of London and what's keeping their church going is their school because the Anglican schools are uh, really hard to get in. So here is a misuse of power. Right, Nigel, are you going to help me decide which parents deserve a school place? I need to write my sermon. What's this all for three weeks? Yes, but I like to think about mine. I'm always surprised by your ability to knock them out at the last minute. No, come on, this is more important. Nigel, wouldn't you like to help me weed out some hypocrites? Okay. Now, the school entry guidelines say that parents must be regular and committed worshippers. We'll cross off anyone booking a late baptism for a start. Oh, that's a good idea. We did the Ingrams boy last year. He was seven. It was a nightmare, more like an exorcism. Now, how are we going to choose from the rest? I was thinking we could do a Bible test for them all. <laughs> oh, that is a good idea. What level of questions? Well, let's practice. You be a parent. Can I ask the questions? No, I'm doing the questions. Hello, Mr. Parent. Hello, Father. Please call me Adam. So, you want little Peter to get into Ellie's school, don't you? Desperately. My entire self-worth depends upon it. <laughs> right, so tell me, which was the first of the Gospels to be written? Mark, AD 65 to 80. Easy. Where was the epistle of Philemon written, and by who? whom? By St Paul, in prison. It's too easy. It's fun, though. Who is the Gospel of Luke written to? My dear Theophilus. Where today would you find... Modern-day Iraq. Okay. Who sold Joseph into captivity? Oh, good one. Uh, the Midianites. Ah, ah, no, it wasn't. It was the Ishmaelites. Wasn't it? I think you found it was the Midianites. Was it? It was, yep. Anyway, we'll do a test, and if your parents don't know the answer, the kid doesn't get in. So let's not be like that. Let's learn how to um, have empathy, compassion. Um, and for those things that we do have power over um, to learn how to share our resources. I wanna talk about this new book that I've um, just wrote and I, I just got a copy uh, two days ago. They just mailed me a copy of my own book. So I just want to let you know that. Uh, well, I have, I'll have an image up here to show you. 
But I, I want to I want to talk about how um, Christian spirituality needs to be practical. And one of the arguments I'm making here is that restorative justice, really, the root of it is Christian spirituality, but it's also restorative justice brings a practicality to our Christian spirituality that we've lost um, because we've become so individualistic of understanding what spirituality is. And this practical interdependence is to me our power. And yeah, I think that's power. Being interdependent is power. And this way of understanding God's forgiveness creates this practical interdependence. And we cannot avoid being interdependent. Uh, we do that at our own peril. Those in power, who, and when we think we can just walk by the afflicted or not even see them, or see those who are poor as invisible, we ignore that at our own peril as our pandemic is teaching us that we are, whether we like it or not, as human beings interde interdependent, and our technology is increasing this through the process of globalization is actually in plain sight showing us that we are all interdependent around the planet and eventually we will see these arbitrary boundaries of nation states are in fact arbitrary boundaries so it's it's important for us to hold on to our christian spirituality because i think it helps us to show power as interdependence this is my new book, and that's a lot of the, the themes of this, that I'm trying to portray in this new book. But the, the main thing I'm saying is that this guy is a saint. Um, and those who are usually holy um, fade in our attention span and do not get the attention that we need because of what I was trying to say earlier about our way of seeing the world through power. And so I really have seen this as a calling to try to expose this life as a saintly life. And I want to just, it's, you know, pictures better than words. So I always try to teach using video clips and images. And I see Bill preaches that way too. And I think that's the way that we can teach more effectively in our world today. So here is a three minute clip and then I'll just open things up for us for discussion. Desmond Tutu's contribution to South Africa did not stop here. He had planned to leave his home in Cape Town and retire to America and spend time with his grandchildren. But then Nelson Mandela asked him to lead the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was a request that the Archbishop could not turn down it heard from the victims of apartheid and heard the stories of the victims, which was an enormously emotional process. Nokle Mohapi was the first to take the stand. Her husband, Mapetla, died in custody 20 years ago. The authorities claimed it was suicide. I want help, she said. I want the truth because I know that my husband never killed himself. Desmond Tutu knew that without confronting the past, South Africa could not move forward, and he wanted to hear from all those affected by apartheid. Now, Archbishop was very keen to hear, as he said, the stories of the little people, not necessarily the big famous stories about which there was already considerable evidence, but stories of people in small towns, in faraway places, whose suffering had been ignored for so long. Mary Burton worked with Desmond Tutu throughout the commission and sat with him through all the testimonies. It was an enormous task. There were altogether um, close on 22,000 statements made to us in those years. And then he fell down on the pavement and he died about half an hour later. It was often very heartbreaking the sheer magnitude of the suffering and the repeated stories and the fact that so many people had been ignored and suffered in silence for so long. 
I think everybody who was part of the Truth Commission was changed by it to some extent. Desmond Tutu himself was deeply affected by the stories he heard. He responded within the first day or two by breaking down at one stage. And after that, he got upset with himself and disgusted with Leia and said, this shouldn't be about me. This should be about the victims. I'm going to take attention away from the victims unless I can learn to control my emotions. And thereafter, you'd see him biting his hand like that when he was getting emotional to, to ensure that the focus remained on the victims. Oh, Holy Spirit, calm the turmoil within. The commission was a government initiative and not overtly religious, but the fact that the archbishop was the chair did have a significant influence. Amen. We discussed in the Commission's meeting whether the Archbishop should wear his purple robes at the hearing, and the majority view was that he shouldn't. And we said so really quite strongly, this is not a religious commission. And the Archbishop listened to all of these arguments, and then he said, the people want it. And he was quite right. The people, particularly the victims who were testifying, whether they were Christian or not, they wanted to shake his hand. They wanted to be touched by him. His presence was important to them. And his purple robes lent a solemnity to the occasion that I think was very important. So he had that sense of what people wanted and what people needed and what he could give to them. Despite the fact that terrible crimes were being recalled, forgiveness, something at the heart of Christianity, was central to the Commission's aims. The reason d'etre for this Commission is opening wounds, cleansing them so that they do not fester, and saying we have dealt with our past as effectively as we could. We have not denied it. We have looked the beast in the eye. I think we, learnt, we all learned a great deal during the commission about forgiveness, about how you reach it, about the fact that most people don't reach it, um, about the fact that even if you do it once, you actually have to, in a way, keep on, on and on forgiving if you want to be healed and be sane uh, after terrible suffering. One of the things that the archbishop made very clear was the fact that uh, forgiveness is not easy. Um, and he would often say that you, you are in love with your wife. You do something wrong, and even in the privacy of your bedroom, it is hard to say, I'm sorry. And here we are asking people publicly, in the glare of television cameras, to say sorry for a very horrendous deed. And the Archbishop was just trying to show that forgiveness is not cheap. You led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You got those people who'd been tortured to face those people who had done the torturing and presided over tremendously difficult stories. Yes, I mean, it, was, it was just that inf incredible, it was an incredible privilege. Uh, sitting, uh, presiding, and, and, and really being humbled by the incredible magnanimity, the generosity of spirit. Forgiveness, when you sat in that Truth and Reconciliation Commission and you hear your own people sobbing and telling you stories of their own torture, of the loss of their loved ones, yeah. How do you start? How, how would you tell somebody how to start to forgive? Well, we didn't, we didn't have to tell them. Uh, and we, as I say, had the privilege of sitting there and listening to the stories. Um, and, and people generally moved on because there is something therapeutic about telling your story. It, it's, it's that you are you are being acknowledged. You are not a cipher. You are someone. And that's, that, that is something that says, yes, the suffering that you underwent 
was not just something that said poof into the sky, it contributed to the freedom we are now enjoying. So I end here and, and open up for any kind of a feedback um, that you might have, questions, comments, before your service begins. Father Michael, this is Shirley, and I, <laughs> I needed you and probably still do as uh, my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was quite, quite moving for me. Um, a, a lot of things I'm going through my mind right now. My good Christian friend, Eric Linder, gave me a picture of an African woman that was holding her child. And she was raped by a man that had HIV. So she had a baby. And she said that she is obliged to love this child. Now, in her effort in trying to forgive this man, like so many people have told me for my situation, you can forgive, but you don't have to forget. And I find that very difficult because in, in remembering, and, you know, it brings, and day to day, something happens that's going to bring back something that's going to make you remember. And I find that forgiving has to be on a daily basis because I'll get forgive what I think I have forgiven him one day and the next day something happens that triggers it and, and I'm back to square one. So I cannot, I find that that I cannot fully or I haven't fully forgiven this person. Um, my son was killed by a hit and run and, um, and, and, and to move on. And I really need to, to forgive to the point where I don't re remember so that I can move on. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it's, it's a hinder for me, you know? Um, and I, I just don't know where to go from here. Um, well, for, first, Shirley, thank you for your vulnerability. Um, I think one thing that you just did for us as a community is that you made us more of a community for you. And by uh, telling your story, and this is part of what the methodology of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is, by telling the story, you create that um, common identity that we never would have had. So I want to say that. And then I think secondly, um, if, if you took my course that I have on um, a Christian spirituality restorative justice, I, I, would, I would say to you in more of a provocative way that only God forgives. And it takes the pressure off of us to think and measure up to what we are supposed to be doing for forgiveness. And I think in light of your own life and your articulation of the, the afflictions that you are navigating yourself, um, I'd encourage you to understand that, that God is the one who ultimately has that power. And what we do is we participate, like in Bill's sermon today, we try to find where Jesus is and we try to just hold on to his coattails and we try to go along with him and hold on to him um, as we navigate such a world as this. And that's really what forgiveness is for us. We are participating in what God has already done and is doing. And then I think thirdly, just in terms of your, um, I, I, you have a character that I think consistent from, I think our, our last session to reveal that which oftentimes we keep in secret. So you are um, a catalyst in this community to help people be honest. Um, so I just want to encourage you um, to continue and, and not to put the pressure on you to make something right. You know, the thing that also that comes to mind, you know, I actually happened to, 
as I was saying in the chat, I have this used to be an area that I taught at, in Canada, and I and Brenda Morrison and I were on a dissertation committee. So I, I actually met her before the person at Simon Fraser University, and um, the you know the, the 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 particularly with the TRC, it's not that it's not that 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 one event or meeting or acknowledgement. Um, where the victim comes forward and then the perpetrator comes forward, that 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 is never going to be enough for the work that people have to do. Um, so there's always going to be work to do, and it's never. And and part of the the challenges we have with restorative justice is because our system is so punitive and retributive that uh, and without um, there's all letter and no spirit. Um, restorative justice often has to bear the brunt of like replacing the entire system and being the spiritual source of that system. And um, so I, it, we, have, we have to be careful that we don't expect restorative justice to do everything for us, you know, and, and that's the, I, I, I wish it was otherwise, but that's just the, that's just what we have before us. So, you know, uh, what, I, what I do think it does is it places the community at the front, as Michael's saying, and then also it, it provides um, it provides a different way of of thinking about justice than just trying to somehow inflict pain in proportion to the pain that has been caused, which is really really limiting. Um, you know, the pain that is caused can't be taken away by inflicting pain. There might be some satisfaction. Um, but that satisfaction is usually hollow and it's never meted out in the ways we want it to. What other questions? So there's been so many questions in the, in the chat. I want to, you know, Alyssa asked a really good question, Michael, which is, uh, you know, what about major crimes and things like that? And how do we see that? That was one of the earlier uh, questions. And also Katie Allen mentioned that, um, you know, this is something she's been doing in the schools. And maybe, Alyssa, if it's okay with you, maybe because Katie had that earlier in the chat, maybe you can speak about your experience a little bit the last two years in the Troy schools, Katie. Well, I think the first thing was for us to recognize that despite our best efforts, all the inequities were persisting. And um, it's, uh, I mean, it's shameful almost when you try to think of yourself as um, an upstanding, loving person to know that uh, everyone is not being treated fairly. And um, so it has been um, an effort then from across our district to make sure that that equity has been happening. And it's not the, the deep, um, I mean, like, like Alyssa was talking about the violent crimes that um, she had mentioned, um, and that my I mentioned my cousin who's Crown Counsel in, uh, in Ontario has been has been dealing with. But there is, I mean, there, there is a sense of um, relief. And I think the, the important part was, as Shirley had shared her story and how um, we had mentioned um, previously that, that the, the identity is getting out there as we share our, our ideas. And when people hear what has happened, then the empathy can grow. Yeah, and it, 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 that's beautifully put. And then Alyssa, you, you were asking a question. I wanna just note, uh, I am embarrassed. Uh, John Whitcomb, we're so glad that you're here. Um, there's a time change in the United States, which should be discontinued. Uh, yeah. So it actually, we I put our, clock, our, our, our clocks back. I think we're going to start a petition today with the, everybody here. <laughs> and I, and Manisha said, do you want to write him? I said, it's probably too late. So we're so grateful that you're here. And just to give you a quick recap, Michael did a beautiful um, uh, contemplative uh, discussion about restorative justice and the TRC in South Africa. So it's probably oh. something you know a bit about. Um, so as maybe as you get yourself going, 
uh, you can jump in when, when the time comes. And so Katie Allen just shared, uh, Shirley initially shared about struggles with forgiveness and uh, it beautifully, and, and Michael responded beautifully with that. And then Katie just shared a bit of um, discussion about um, the nature of, of restorative justice in the Troy schools. And particularly that has been used to address um, disparities in, uh, among students of color who tend to be singled out in the school disciplinary programs and, and thereby stigmatizing and creating um, conditions for failure. And, um, and so what, 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 the, what the Michigan Department of Education began to do is shift to a, to a restorative justice paradigm in order to somehow address this. And Katie was saying that she was seeing some definite benefits from that. Did I do a good job summarizing? Thank God. Okay, so then moving to Alyssa, Alyssa raised the question in the chat about major crimes such as sexual violence and uh, in, in restorative justice. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, Alyssa, um, I'm not saying that the way we understand incarceration um, precludes the, the atrocious crimes that occur that we still need prisons. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that the whole methodology of assuming who is a reprobate, even in those crimes, um, the way we understand prisons as basically punishment and not any sort of restoration, that's where I think the Christian voice and worldview is so important to say no one is beyond redemption. Um, and, and I really appreciate the early Christian mystics who say that even the devil is not beyond redemption um, because God's love is unrelenting and, and eventually we all give in to that love. So prisons are important to keep the society from um, imploding, especially those who are um, in such uh, a violent way of seeing the world. They need to be separated from the communities. It's just that even, even those who have uh, been the perpetrators of affliction, basically from what I'm hearing you say, um, as Christians, we have to be careful not to give in to any kind of worldview to say that some people are beyond redemption. In my, you know, and, and I think that having, there are countries that have done a more thoroughgoing restorative justice approach. Not only do you have that in South Africa now, it's knit within the penal code, but in Canada, they do it as well. And I say this, um, there have been, there are mistakes that are made in any system of justice. And so there, and, and I think particularly when you're dealing with major crimes, um, this is where mistakes that are made become incredibly painful. And so there have been cases in South Africa where people have gotten much lighter sentences because they tried to, they apologized to the mother of the victim, for example, and that was seen as um, important. And, and, um, and so I, I think that, I think that there's always gonna be, um, there's always gonna be slippage. And, and I, what I do, appreciate about restorative justice is it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, you know, I, I view the um, most of the punishments that are given in a retributive program to be just, um, I, don't, I don't know if I can't, I could not tell you that they satisfy anybody. Yeah, and also just to add on to what Bill is saying, most people who are in prison are not committing those kinds of big uh, crimes, um, and we're, we're slowly seeing that and starting to release those non those who have committed nonviolent crimes. Yeah, in fact, I mean, I don't want to. Um, I do think the last president, President Trump, they're under his um, his his time in office. Actually, there was a significant piece of legislation around criminal justice reform, and um, 
it's something we should all be aware of uh, because it, it was it, it, it was bipartisan. It was passed in a hurry. The fact that we had Republicans and Democrats agreeing about something should have been lifted up maybe a little bit higher um, than, than, than other and, things. And it was a really important step. Yeah, by the way, there is a bipartisan agreement not to change the time anymore. Excellent. Um, so there's a couple other questions. Um, Troy Dostert was making a, I would like him to just present it because he's put out a few paragraphs that are brilliant. Well, well, there, there are two different questions here, Father Bill, which, which do you want me to talk about? Both, you're so good. No, no, I'm just thinking. Um, I, the, the, first, the first one is, is, um, is, is regarding the Old Testament tradition, which as I understand it is almost entirely retributive. I, 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 may, ha I may be short-sighted about this, but I, I just think of so many instances um, where the Ten Commandments were used punitively uh, as, a, as a basis for, for punishment. At least that's what the scriptures suggest. Father Bill raised a good point about uh, the extent to which these punishments were actually carried out. But if you look at the, at the letter of the scripture, right, it's quite clear uh, that there are severe penalties to be meted out for violating um, a lot of the Jewish law. And then it seems to me we come to Jesus and he's given the opportunity to reinforce that tradition. Uh, and I'm thinking of the woman caught in adultery where the Pharisees come to him and essentially try to trap him. And he evades that, right? Um, he doesn't exactly repudiate the tradition. It's not clear that he rejects it whole, wholesale. Um, but clearly, I think we interpret him as moving in that direction. And that's in a restorative vein, I think. So we've got that tension, right? And it, it seems to me that the Christian tradition over the centuries has often been caught in that, in that tension. Um, so that's the question that I was raising first that just occurred to me. So. Yeah, before you go to the second question, my quick response is basically that there are traditions in Judaism that are restorative, you know, such as, you know, Isaiah and the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, so even in the Hebrew Bible and Midrash, there, there are traditions that are more restorative justice than retributive. But you're right though, Choi, the preponderance of the evidence of the worldview seems to be more retributive justice. Yeah, and, and just to pick up on that, I mean, uh, what, what I'm relying on are some uh, biblical scholars that are have just, they've tried to to, to, to piece together what actually was practiced in Israel. So you don't have like an official, you know, maimer, right? Like if you say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, um, and you go before a magistrate, you would not only have the magistrate deciding, you'd have somebody out there to like take the other eye out. And, um, and that person would be, you know, a professional um, um, court official. And you don't have any evidence of that, um, for example. Um, so, so the, um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, yes, um, what, what happened in Christianity is in the, the 18th and 19th century, most prison reform happened by Christians advocating for something. And what they advocated for was rehabilitation. And so all of our vast uh, prison industrial complex came about because people thought that rehabilitation could be possible, that you could actually provide uh, the context for people to improve and then come out better. The whole idea of the cell was borrowed from monasticism, where you'd actually sequester yourself to experience transformation. So the cell was used as a kind of forced spiritual change. And um, the Quakers actually practiced that in Philadelphia in, in one of the first jails that we ha had. And this was seen as initially as an incredibly beautiful step forward. It was a humanistic thing to do. But what happens is two things. Um, one, no matter what, it's hard to imagine our prison system actually delivering uh, rehabilitation. It's hard to make someone experience conversion. And it's also hard for the system that we have in place. And it has been shown again and again, actually to increase recidivism, right? It increases 
it increases the number of people who end up in prison again. And, um, and, and then the second is, you know, um, it's entirely focused on the individual, right? So just as retribution was entirely focused on the offender, um, uh, rehabilitation became entirely focused on the, on, the, on the offender and not on how the community could actually become restored as a result of this or feel safer again, which is what I think Michael's first video was so brilliant in showing is that for many people, not, not all people, but for many people, um, the trauma of that crime never goes away. And, and because there's no system in place to actually help that person heal, except to do a victim impact statement, which is um, usually done uh, under incredibly pressured situations in which you have to, you're contending uh, with in, in, in an adversarial context. Um, and, and you, um, you know, it, very few people after reading a victim impact state, statement walk away saying, wow, I feel better. Um, they, and there's very few experiences of them actually achieving any of the goals they would have. So, you know, the, it, because you get worked up and you want the person to suffer and then the mm -hmm. sentence will never seem to be enough. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I think restorative justice is key here. Uh, with that, and 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 it's something that um, you do find um, it's some emerging elements of it in the in the New Testament. You know, in in Peter and Jesus on the beach after uh, in the in God in the Gospel of John, and the woman in the caught in adultery, and all of the ways in which you see restoration. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for that. that oh, my. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, the, um, and then I think Manisha has something, or then Amy, um, yeah, Amy, Amy was reminding us of the Jubilee year, which is another whole fold in this, obviously in the, um, and then what it, the, um, here, here's the, um, here's the question that Chris had, uh, which I think is really important. Uh, Michael, might you comment on the role of reparations in the context of retributive and restorative justice? Sure. Um, I think that's part that that was a part of the overall process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and they did provide um, what really um, was more of, of a symbolic um, demonstration of reparations. Um, it goes back to what I'm trying to say about affliction. I mean, how do you really um, offer compensation that is proportionate to those stories that you heard. I think um, the reparation also is, is written into the constitution. Um, so um, everyone in South Africa has a right for housing. Um, you know, by the way, South Africa's uh, constitution is really incredible. Um, and it, it is one of the first constitutions that included the full, um, human rights for those of different sexual orientations. Um, and also the, this constitution is saying that because of the history of colonialism, um, uh, uh, black South Africans have the full right to have a house, utility, electricities, water, and, and the right for uh, school. Now they are about to change it. This is interesting for what's going on in the US to include universities. So there is a right to have um, a university education without cost. And the big protests going on in South Africa, South Africa has a lot of muscle memory for protesting and they still do that, but they're doing it nonviolently for the most part for university students. It's called no fees or it's called fees must fall. So. Yeah, reparations are important. The TRC, as um, Bill was saying, um, did not complete by any means the process of reparation, but they added amendments to the constitution that I think are helpful, such as those amendments of the right for housing and utilities and education. And just, and just to respond to, to Larry, uh, to Leslie's uh, uh, in really important, um, point, you know, that from her observation, the victims of <clears throat> Larry Nasser's abuse 
seem to benefit greatly from their victim impact statements. Again, I don't, I don't want to say that there's, um, there's not a possible benefit. I mean, there are people who go through prison and get better. Um, we do I mean there are that can happen and it gets documented. And there are people who will engage in victim impact statements that will be satisfied. Um, uh, but 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 the vast majority when people study it when people step step back and study all of it as a phenomenon of what happens um, they tend to see the preponderance of it, it is not quite what we hope it would be right so I I don't want to say I don't want to make any kind of absolute statement about any of that but I'm just saying that there there have been this has been studied in different ways so you know I guess yeah the yeah no and that's and, and to say to Amy's question, you know, telling your story is key, but 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 what repairs trauma often is empathy, and and that's going to require a larger context than just a courtroom where you're going to speak before someone's sentenced, right? You need actually people around, and then of course Cynthia Zemer, who is with us uh, from time to time. I hope you're well, Cynthia. Um, the um, and it, uh, she's, she said that the restorative justice communal connection is vital to healing and, um, and the medical and mental health model of psychotherapy is not enough. It's a good point. Um, again, one to keep in mind. Any other questions that I'm missing here? This has been so powerful. John, do you have enough background to jump in? I, I think I probably don't have, uh, I, there's only one thing I just was interested to know if Michael told the story. I have a, a colleague here who used to work also with Archbishop Tutu, was fond of referencing what she used to always describe as, as, uh, as, as uh, Tutu's bicycle theology. Does that, does that expression resonate with you? Did you, have you told that, that little um, explainer? No, I, I, I didn't tell it, you tell it. Well, I was, well, you'll tell it probably slightly better um, uh, because you were there, but um, I always found that quite a nice little image. Um, shall, shall I have a go? I'll let me say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Michael, tell me if I got this right or not. So Sarah is my colleague here, um, uh, was my colleague. And he said, the thing is, if somebody steals your bicycle and, um, and he, um, and off it goes, um, uh, you, can, you can be challenged to um, forgive him and uh, feel a burden to forgive him and all the rest of it. Um, and you may indeed forgive him. Um, but at the end of that, um, you still, he still got your bicycle. And so actually, if you're gonna do any restoration, actually, he has to get the bicycle back to you. Um, and it's a kind of a simple concept, but I find that really helpful. And it's just such a simple little, little image that I think kind of plays into some of this restorative justice thing. So apologies if it's a bit simplistic, but I always quite liked it. So you know, well, well said, well said. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, short story. And I, I don't want to tell a long story, but years ago I was working with um, first time juvenile offenders in Tennessee. And there was a moment where these boys got into an altercation and um, uh, one of the little boys, one of the smaller boys had tried to escape them uh, on his bicycle. But when he couldn't go any further on the bicycle, he dropped the bicycle behind and he ran into the woods and they uh, destroyed the bicycle. They kind of just cut up the seat and everything. And he was this, this little boy didn't have a mother and father. He was being raised by his grandparents. The kids got caught. There was this, we had this meeting between the, the victim and the victim had red hair, or no, sorry, the perpetrator had red hair and he accused the victim of making fun of his red hair, which is why he went and destroyed his bicycle. And, and he said that he was gonna come across the table if he makes a, a, a remark about his red hair. So I, I calm everybody down. I, I, and it takes us about three months you know, of, of pre-meetings, all for a, a bicycle. And, uh, and then when the meeting came, the victim had grown probably six inches and put on like 30 pounds of muscle since he had been attacked. And so the minute he walked in the room, he was larger than the perpetrator. And there was this, <laughs> this moment of like, <laughs> everything changed and he sat down and the perpetrator said, you know, Kyle, uh, I should not have hurt you. I should not have done, your, done that to your bicycle. It was just stupid. And then the, his mother immediately began to write a check to fix the, uh, the, the, the pay for the repairs. And then the grandmother of the victim 
said to uh, the the perpetrator, um, "Your red hair is beautiful." Oh. And so that there was this kind of gifting that happened. But you have to have the bicycle. There has to be material reparations uh, as part of it. There has to be something. Something physical has to happen. It has to be a almost like you need bread and wine. I, I do think I do think the United States needs that um, needs a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, um, so many things were given, and the bicycle was never returned. So I, I do think it's important to for the U.S. because we're in a different age, where the next person who's killed, the next black person killed by the police, um, things are such on a scale of anxiety that it's a powder keg. So I, um, I really do think the way of practicing a TRC that has that sort of teeth to it of reparations is important for our country. Manisha, you want to say something? I did. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm grateful for this really important conversation that I think should resonate with all of us. Um, my previous comment was this, this is exactly how God is with us. We, we have afflicted God and um, in ways that actually there is no restoration um, or I, I would say that there's no way of repairing that breach. Um, and, and yet God has shown us this new paradigm of of victim and offender that um, I think still, still requires us to use a very imaginative vision of how to be with one who harms you. And I, I, I would challenge us, since it's Lent, we can, we can push ourselves. I would challenge us to, to stop thinking from the mindset of the victim and start wondering what it's like to be in the shoes of the offender and the perpetrator and the one who has committed wrong systematically and consistently. And how is it that we as Christians can help that person recognize their humanity, their, their lo loved, lo lovedness, their um, ability to be generative and creative um, and to be human again, because um, they are as much in pain and suffering, they have committed something that has robbed them of believing that they are worthy of anything except um, retribution and punishment. Um, and I, I, just, I just think that what, what challenges me is when I've been afflicted and as, as Dr. Battle said in the beginning, you know, I, I have now a responsibility because I believe in Christian forgiveness to think of my um, offender. And um, I don't get to just dismiss him or her or them. I actually have to figure out how to be in relationship with them. And, um, and, I, and I think that requires the victim to have empathy. That's really, really powerful. Uh, in, it, it's obviously a high demand, right? Because what, what I hear you saying, and I just I want to turn to, to Michael and John to hear what they have to say, but you're, what you're saying is there's the victim, the victim becomes responsible in part of the um, of this process through 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 giving empathy. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know that it's simply a, um, a restoration of the way things were. You are now inextricably linked to the persons or person who has done something to you and your journey has been set. And, and for you to, to just simply want to be restored as a victim misses, misses this extraordinary difficult truth which is which is the offender is in as is in need of much of a relationship with you as you are with with them um yeah 
Michael and John would would. Yeah, I would just add to Manisha, Manisha's um, very deep insight that um, that that empathy may simply look like the awareness of the interdependence. Um, and to be aware of the interdependence is to help those who have been victimized not to repeat the, the power of victimizing others. Um, and so empathy is really that awareness that you know violence is a vicious, vicious cycle. And to have the, the awareness of Christian spirituality is not so much for the victim to try to do something in and of yourself, but to understand the transcendence that God offers to see the larger picture of the re chain of reaction that the better way to see that is that still a human being and that our enemies and the persecutions that we face, God can help us engage that so that we're not making matters worse or stuck in a cycle of violence. John? Yeah, I mean, uh, all of that. And thanks to Chris for that link into what I was saying this, uh, in the first session about the shared future. Um, I think it's a really powerful uh, observation, Manisha. Um, I mean, we do find ourselves, you know, without being free of the choice of being forced into some kind of relationship with, with a perpetrator. Um, and we therefore somehow, because we're in relationship, we can't avoid some sense of responsibility for that person um, because that's how kind of God has formed us. Um, so we share a general responsibility for the whole human race, but we share a particular responsibility for those who have somehow become our neighbors, I suppose, to kind of draw on that image. I've been thinking about this a little bit recently um, in relation to the window. I can't remember if I told this story. We had a window, one of the, one of the angels in our huge west screen window of the cathedral was broken just over a year ago. Um, and we don't, it was, it was, it was, somebody put a stone through it. And um, uh, we don't know who did that. I'd really like to know who did it. Apart from anything else, I mean, part of the, fir my, the first reason I wanted to know who did it was I wanted to pick them up and throw them against a wall and, you know, kind of jump on their head, basically. Um, when I began to realize that was not a very Coventry response and was kind of got to work on myself, I've come to feel that actually I'm really bothered by the sense that this. These, these two people, I mean, we have them on CCTV, you just can't tell who they are, will carry the shame of this thing that they did potentially for the whole of their lives. And I'm really bothered by that. Um, you know, we can, we can respond and actually we have creative ways of responding to this destruction, which I hope will actually ultimately be enriching a bit like our new cathedral. Um, so I, I don't, I've got over some of what I feel, I, I think about the resentment and anger but I'm really bothered by this shame that they carry because if, if they were able to identify themselves and we could go through that cycle of forgiveness and we could work out what restoration might look in this environment, then they would be free to live their lives as children of God. And I'm bothered they're not. And it's a really beautiful way of looking at it. You know, the one thing that I would add is um, one of my favorite psychologists was uh, on the TRC uh, Pumla Gobodo Madagazela, and she wrote a, a, a popular book called The Human Being Died That Night, which was about um, one of the main perpetrators trying to find his way to empathy. But I think what she then later developed could be used to, to speak to Manisha's point, which I think is something that needs to, um, this is a point that really needs emphasizing, right? Which is that, um, which is that there's there, she argues that there needs to be empathic repair. Is that that even that you may never be able to to, to forgive, right? That person who hurt you, but you can actually start to begin to develop some empathy for for uh, the other, and that that's kind of key to healing. And um, I do think that that goes with the grain of what you just said, John, about shame, right? Because, you know, psychologists have said, and please, any psychologists out there of any stripe, I want to hear from you. Um, 
uh, but, but psychologists have argued, you know, I think of uh, Rosemary Tangeri and some others have argued that empathy is the proper way to, to uh, free oneself from shame. But not only do we experience empathy from a counselor, but we actually start to begin to move out of the prison that can happen when we're, we're, when we're imprisoned by shame, right? The, 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 um, because that is its own, that is its own uh, challenge and that's its own uh, debilitation, right? Um, yeah, and, that, and that's Amy jumped in um, and said, maybe empathy for the perpetrator's emptiness and deep, uh, and, and deep woundedness. Um, and, then, um, and then Eric, you have a comment it, because it's, um, I'll, 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 you're quoting Shakespeare and I'll let you do it because it, you'll do it better justice than I can. Oh wait, we just have to get you off mute. There. I didn't quote a thing. I was just observing. Oh, sorry. That the great tragedies and strangely many of the more serious comedies all turn on a serious moral spiritual offense which has to be met by the end of Act 5 with an equally extraordinary act of forgiveness and reconciliation. This is missed by people who assume that no great author could possibly have been a believing Christian. Mm. We don't know what he believed. I don't. But I do know that the plays are soaked in the themes of offense and forgiveness. Mm. And mercy. Yeah, measure for measure, for example. Oh, that one is is one of my favorites, and it is unteachable. I've never seen a production that that indicated that the director understood it, but let that go. <laughs> uh, everybody likes to quote, even if they don't know what play it comes from, the quality of mercy is not strained. Portia's great speech on forgiveness. Unfortunately, it's somewhat dimmed by the terrible vein of anti-Semitism that runs through The Merchant of Venice. Yeah. But anyway, Shakespeare has a lot to say on the subject of offense and forgiveness. Beautiful. Um, and then this is the, um, yeah, I mean, that in, in Shirley is raising the question about waiting for an apology. And, and you know, that's the, that's the thing is there's a, uh, the way that you're characterizing it can, you know, is suggest that you can put up with the waiting. Other people, it's very difficult. And, um, and, and then other people don't know what they would do. You know, Michael Lapsley, who is a wonderful leader in the South African resistance who lost both of his hands to a, um, a letter bomb, uh, said he's always wanted to ask the person who sent him the bomb, uh, what did you tell your wife and children that you did the day that you did that to me? How did you account for your time? And that's, that's, that, and that's strangely, you know, again, the weird thing about retribution is like that there, there, there's, there's, there's a shadow of it even in restore, restoration, right? Because to ask someone to admit or to ask someone to engage in that kind of process is a, is a kind of response, right? It's, a, it's its own kind of, of, of challenge. Um, I think we should stop just because it's 1137. We could keep going forever. This has been so, so rich. We're John, thank you so much for being here. We'll send you the first bit so you can <laughs> capture it. It's been such a blessing to have you. Uh, next week we have um, we have, I think, Stephanie Spellers. No, we have we have Shannon McVeigh Brown, who right. is the Bishop of um, Vermont. So that's going to be really exciting. And uh, Michael will be there. Uh, John, you're always welcome. Just keep in mind, it's going to be one hour earlier, uh, maybe not for long, as Michael was suggesting, which I hope so, because I hate this day. Like, this is, <laughs> these are, I don't know about you, but like every time we spring ahead at church, I'm always like, oh, we're going to have no one's going to show, no one's going to come to church. And sometimes that's been true. So, why don't we close with prayer? And um, Father Chris, can you close us with prayer? 
Is Father Michael's book available for sale now? Or no? Yes, it is. We put it up the link on Amazon. And if, if things get better, Shirley, I'm going to try to talk Father Michael into coming and, uh, and preaching, maybe even Pentecost. But we have to see if we can get our infection rate down. Okay. And we have to get him, we have to get him vaccinated. <laughs> I have my first shot. You did? Oh. Great. Pfizer. Excellent. Any effects? I'm not too bad. The second one is supposed to be the the doozy. The, yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill, you want to be the people? Oh no! Have Michael do that. All right. Let us pray. Oh God, make speed to save us. Oh Lord, oh, Lord, make haste to help us. us. Glory to the Father, the Father and, to the Son, and to the Son, and to the Holy, to Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as it was in the, was beginning, in the beginning, is now, is now and will be, forever. will be forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. As a father has compassion on his children, so is the Lord merciful towards those who fear him. For he knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was, was in, the in the beginning, is now, is now and will be forever. Will be forever. Amen. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who re reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the mystery, the ministry of reconciliation. Let us confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatreds. Let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and establish the peace which God wills for his children. The hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. Father, forgive. The covetous desire of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Father, forgive. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Father, forgive. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Father, forgive our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Father, forgive the lust which dishonors the bodies of men, women, and children. Father, forgive the pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not in God. Father, forgive. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. God of unbounded grace, you declare the power of your reconciling love in the death and resurrection of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Teach us who live only in your forgiveness to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. Heal our divisions and cast out our fears through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Mend what is broken. Unite what is divided. Live the gospel. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody who helped organize. Thank you for all of you who offered some incredibly brilliant, brilliant, brilliant feedback. Blessed by each and every one of you. And we'll see you next week.